So there you are, just a lesson in Anitra, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but it doesn't really matter so much because we have, I think, enough time to look at the main aspects of these suttas anyway. So we should be should be all right. Uh, so the um, sutta I want to look at now is on page 26 in your little booklet. It's called the shorter elephant's footprint simile, or the simile of the the shorter simile of the elephant's footprint, or something like that. Uh, and uh, n what I'm going to do now is to look at all the various factors of the path, because we are looking at the noble eightfold path. Yeah, this is what this is about. Uh, and the noble eightfold path is not really discussed in such great detail within those eight factors, uh, but in the gradual training you find every factor, one after the other, kind of coming out, expanded a lot. So there you can see how all of these things actually fit together. Uh. So the gradual training is one of those great things in the suttas, uh, and uh, it is something that occurs very often uh, yeah, in the Majjhima the middle length sayings. Uh, <coughs> you have maybe <coughs> Ten uh, versions of the uh, of the gradual training. If you go to the Dika Nikaya, you have twelve or thirteen, uh, and it's also the odd version in the uh, Anguttara Nikaya as well. So it's a long teaching, and it occurs in many places. Uh, and for that reason, you can assume that it is an important teaching. Uh, in fact, what it does again, it fleshes out the noble eightfold path, uh, and it gives you that whole path kind of set up basically. Uh. So, uh, and it has a lot of other nice things as well, this particular sutta. I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to get to that, but uh, anyway, we, uh, let's have a look at this first. So, this is how it goes. Uh, a householder or a householder's son, or one born in some other clan, hears that Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considers thus. How so life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. So this is how it starts out. Yeah, Everything kind of starts out in this way. So you have a, a householder or householder's son. That they, these are called Gahapati in Pali. These are like the establishment in ancient India. And uh, the reason why it is put in that way is doesn't just say someone goes forth, it specifies who it is. Uh, and the reason is because uh, the Dhamma is so important that it doesn't matter who you are, even if you're part of the establishment, the upper classes or whatever you want of that society, still you go forth in the Dhamma. And uh, it's interesting when you look at the suttas uh, and you look at the background for all the monks and nuns, mostly they were from the Brahmin clan, yeah, the very top of society, Brahmin and Katyas or Kshatriyas. Uh, these were the top, uh, most of the monks were from that. Uh, and uh, it, that was not because uh, uh, lower castes were not allowed to ordain, they were, but they just weren't as inclined, it seems, to ordain. I guess they probably had too much difficulties with life already, so it was harder for them to ordain. But there were some, even from the very lower classes, who ordained. So. Uh, you hear the Dhamma. When you hear the Dhamma, you acquire faith in the Tathagata. Tathagata is this slightly mystical word, uh, which means something like one who is gone thus, or come thus, or come to truth. Yeah, Tata can mean truth. It can mean all of those things, uh, and it hasn't really got a very clearly defined meaning. So the word existed in India before the Buddha, Tathagata, and then uh, the Buddha took that word on board uh, as a reference to himself. So when the Buddha speaks of himself, uh, he always says Tathagata. He never says Buddha or anything like that. He says Tathagata, this slightly mysterious person. Yeah, Nobody really knows who it is. Uh, it's mysterious you, when you read some of the philosophical uh, queries or, or, or questions or debates they had at the time. One of those debates was, does the Tathagata exist after death? Does it not exist after death? Does it both exist and not exist after death? Does it neither exist nor not exist after death? <laughs> this was a standard kind of philosophical query and they would run around India and they would ask these questions and then they would classify your teaching yeah, according to this kind of questionnaire. But you see Tathagata is there and that so that Tathagata is part of the Indian culture before the Buddha. Huh? And of course the Buddha, what do, how does he answer those questions? Uh? 
What do you think? What do you think is what it says? Does it exist, not exist, both exist and not exist? Neither exist nor not exist? You wonder what these things can even mean. Neither exist nor not exist. It's kind of strange. <laughs> but this is India for you. It's kind of philosophy, you know. It, um, and uh, the answer is that the Buddha, he never replies to that question there. And that is actually very interesting. He says that those, that question is unprofitable. Uh, it doesn't lead to the end of suffering. Uh, it doesn't have any kind of good outcome. Uh, it just leads to more speculation and problems. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is, again, what I was mentioning yesterday about logic being dependent on your assumptions. Uh, so if you are going to use a logic to try to decide something about the world, uh, then if your assumptions are wrong, it's gonna, the whole logic is going to be messed up. And the assumption behind these questions, this is India, they had the assumption of a sense of self. Yeah, the Atta or the Brahma, the self was always the assumption. Uh, we would take away that assumption and the whole questions don't make any sense anymore. Huh? And this is the point here, from the Buddha's point of view. Huh? So these are interesting little things, uh, at least for me. I don't, I don't know if I do, but uh, if, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. If not, then uh, I don't know what to say. If you <laughs> so you hear that Dhamma and you acquire faith in the Tathagata. Yeah? So hearing the Dhamma and acquiring faith, this is like right view. Yeah, you think, wow, this is really cool. Yeah, the Buddha, cheap, is, he has a kind of really exceptional teaching here. Yeah. I'm going to become a Buddhist. This is the best teaching ever. And you get really kind of inspired by it. Uh, and you throw aside all the kind of existing religions. Uh, and then you, so you, you take on that view of the Buddha, even though you don't know, uh, you take it on board because uh, uh, you, are, you gain faith. You see that the actions of the Buddha concur with how he speaks and sp the way he speaks concur with his actions. It's all congruent. It all has integrity. Uh, there's something about the Buddha which is very powerful and attractive and you get drawn in yeah, against... This. Maybe even you never wanted to be, be a religious person. Suddenly you find yourself as a religious person. Uh, or do you? <laughs> Is Buddhism a religion? <laughs> It's one of those very difficult questions, isn't it? Uh, is it a I, and I would say, it depends on how you practice it. Uh, some people definitely practice Buddhism as a religion. They go to the Buddha statue and say that, oh, you know, my, my old BMW is no longer any good, but, but I need a new BMW. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, this is how people often use these things. And uh, that, of course, is very, very problematic. Basically, they're taking an idea from Christianity or Islam or something, importing it into Buddhism. But the Buddha is not around. He can't do anything for you. The Buddha doesn't just appear and say, yeah, okay, here, here's a new car, please. Uh, have you ever seen that happen? It doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so, uh, but many people actually use Buddhism like that. So there's all kind of shades of grey. And there are some people who use Buddhism. I, I gave a talk about Buddhism, what it is, at Dhammaloka Center in Perth a while ago. And <coughs> in my opinion, Buddhism is best described as a psychology. It's about how to use the mind, how to develop the mind, how to gain insight, how to purify the mind. It's all about mental phenomena and how to direct your mind in the right direction. So psychology, uh, to me, is the best description of early Buddhism, the Buddhism of the Buddha. Yeah? That is not the philosophy, because the philosophy is about thinking. Uh, philosophy is about kind of working things out, uh, trying to kind of make some kind of fancy system. Uh, it's not really a philosophy, but a psychology is getting very close. Uh, and still, it sounds perhaps a bit dry, so maybe something like a spiritual psychology or something like, like that might get you fairly close to what Buddhism is. Uh. Anyway, I'm getting a bit sidetracked as usual, so that, um, uh, that is what this uh, householder, householder's son, or uh, householder's daughter. The Pali word is actually putta, and putta is often gender neutral. It could also, it could also mean daughter as well. Uh. Possessing that faith, he considers thus. Household life is crowded and dusty. Uh. Life gone forth is wide open. Uh. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Household life is crowded and dusty here. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I think, uh, sure. <laughs> okay, that's good. So, uh, because uh, crowded, yeah, you live together, closely together. Even here in Malaysia, you, it's not like ancient India where everyone lived in one big room yeah, and the, kind of the whole family was there. It was even more crowded, even more dusty. 
But even now, yeah, you live in a, even if you have a big house or big apartment or whatever, still there is that impingement on you with people around you. And there is that impingement of houses, the neighboring house being very close to you as well. And you feel that, it's strange. I always feel that because I usually I live in the forest down in Serpentine. Yeah, many of you have been down there, you know what it looks like. And it's just so nice to go back to your cutie. When I'm in my cutie, I don't see anyone else. Well, actually I do because I have a, I have a million dollar view, so I can see far away. I can see some you know, house 50 kilometers away or something. That doesn't really matter. So, uh, and that is such a, one of the beautiful things about the monastic life. If you live that life well, uh, in the right place, with the right kind of teacher, uh, you get this feeling of being aloof from the world. Your mind also then becomes aloof. It's as if you let go a little bit of all that uh, attachment and, and clinging and whatever it is uh, that uh, most people have in the world. And you feel free. You feel a sense of freedom because of that. Uh. But in the city you can never have that. Uh. Yeah, even when you have a big mansion and um, I've seen some big mansions in my life, but uh, uh, even if you have a really big mansion, uh, yeah, in Perth, for example, the real estate is incredibly expensive, especially the good real estate on the river, very, very expensive. So you have this enormous mansion, but they're only half a meter apart. Yeah, it's like you're living on top of each other. Yeah. And I would much rather have my tiny, tiny mansion in the hills of Serpentine. I'm not sure if mansion is the right word, but you know what I mean? My tiny little hut uh, with nobody around. Uh, far better. I don't need any servants to clean out because it takes two minutes to clean the whole place up. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh. So this is an important point. You start to understand the importance of that aloofness uh, or kind of separating yourself from that world uh, which is so, which makes your mind busy and it causes attachments and all kinds of things. Uh. And I, I noticed that, it was interesting, I noticed that when my father died, because uh, when my father died I went back to my family and of course it was much more difficult for them to deal with my father's death than for me. Uh, and a big part of that was precisely the fact that I've lived as a monk for so long uh, and I've been away for so long and that being away it creates a kind of barrier. Uh, he, your, your father is no longer part of your mind, you have kind of built up your, a, a mental a life which is independent in the large part of the external world, yeah? at least moving in that direction. And then it is not so bad anymore. You can deal even with the most difficult things in the world uh, and let it go uh, and kind of go with the flow and it's not so hard. Uh. So this is the idea of crowded, uh, dusty. Dusty is a similar kind of thing. Dust in uh, Pali is often a metaphor for attachments yeah? and holding on. Uh, and these attachments, they always cause problems in life, uh, always, cr cr you know, they create arguments and problems and, and all these kind of things. Uh. And we know what that is like when you live family life on top of each other, it's very hard to live with perfect harmony. Is anyone here who has perfect harmony in the family life? I w I w in, in that case, we can need some good advice from you. <laughs> it's very, very difficult, uh, except, uh, yeah, an arahant, they don't have children, so there's no family life. Okay. So this then is the right intention, yeah? This is the right aim, this is the right goal, this is the right thought, ad according to Adan Sujato. This thinking that you want to leave this behind, you have a new aim in life, you want to do things differently, you want to become a monk or a nun instead. This is what this is all about. So this is the second fact of the Noble Life of Path. From right view, right aim, right purpose, right intention springs. You can see why right view is so important. Yeah, your whole life, everything you pursue, everything you go, you are interested in, comes from that right view. Huh? This is why it matters so enormously here. Yeah? And reflecting on this actually really makes a massive difference for how you live your life and, and what happens as a consequence. So that right view is in place, right intention arises. Uh, Sounds a bit tough, yeah, right intention defined as you have to become a monk or nun, you don't have to. You can also live a lay life, uh, uh, but then you just live lay life in a different way. You start to think about lay life in a different way. Uh, you think more about how you live life rather than thinking about all the kind of uh, superficial external things in your life. This is really the point there. And I, I should say for the sake of uh, I don't, w I don't want to come across as a bully or anything, but that is perfectly okay to have a BMW as long as you don't get too attached to it. Yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the thing here. Yeah. So I, I, I don't have any problem with people being, uh, uh, you know, you, you can be wealthy and you can be a good person. Yeah. And uh, so that it's not a problem in Buddhism, it's how we live that matters, not what we have. Uh. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the ochre robe, not yellow, ochre robe, 
and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, uh, abandoning a small or a large fortune, uh, abandoning a small or a large circle of relatives, uh, he shaves off his hair and beard, uh, puts on the ochre robe, uh, and goes forth uh, from home life into homelessness. So here you have right intention again. Uh, yeah? You now decide to you abandon everything that you own. Uh, you give up a small or large fortune. Uh, well, what is it that you basically just give it to your family, yeah? Because those days families were kind of units, uh, so family just took it over, I suppose. And then you abandon all your relatives, uh, and it sounds a bit harsh. It doesn't mean that you never see them again. It just means that you uh, you see them less. That's really what it means. Then you go forth. Uh, you become a monk or a nun as a consequence. Having thus gone forth uh, and possessing. The bhikkhu's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, uh, he abstains from killing living beings. Uh, with rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, uh, merciful, he abides compassionate uh, to all living beings. Uh, so that is the uh, version found in the suttas uh, of the five precepts. Yeah, the first one, Panati Pata Vera Manisi Kaparang Samadhyami. Same one, but it's not exactly the same. It is slightly different, and this actually this difference is actually quite interesting, and I want to just uh, discuss that briefly. Yeah. So uh, the abandoning of killing living beings is, uh, is obviously fundamental uh, to the spiritual life. Uh, yeah, if you're going to live that life, and I would really recommend you to try to do that uh, 100% if you can. Uh, it's very easy to get annoyed by mosquitoes or, or whatever, uh, but uh, ideally you avoid that. You remember, they too want to live. Uh, yeah, they, have, they have actually have feelings, they actually want to live. Uh, if you try to squash it, it will fly away. Uh, there is a will there, uh, there's something there that wants to exist. Uh, so try to see the world a little bit from the point of view of the mosquito. Uh, not so easy, <laughs> but uh, you have some idea. Yeah, they are actually much more like us than we think they are. Uh, that's the first part. Take, t take, see if you can take these precepts quite seriously, because what you are really doing when you take them seriously is that you're not just avoiding the killing, but you actually learn to understand compassion. Uh, this is kind of the point here. Uh, when you understand that the mosquito doesn't want to die and they are a bit like us, well, what you're really doing is you, you understand, you have compassion for that little being. Uh, so once we, when we try to improve our morality like this, actually it develops in unexpected ways. Uh, so you stop killing, compassion starts to arise. You start to look at the world differently. Uh, and uh, this is the thing which makes this um, rule here, or this kind of way of living here, different uh, from what you find in the five precepts. Uh, because you abandon the killing of living being, uh, but then you are conscientious. You are merciful. Uh, you abide compassionate to all living beings. Uh, and this is the difference, and this is a very important difference, uh, because one is like a negative morality, yeah, I don't kill living beings, that's kind of avoiding something, uh, but this here is a very strong positive kind of morality, where you, you actively support other living beings, uh, you have compassion for them, uh, you look after them, you see, uh, you know, when they're suffering in the world, you kind of, your heart goes out to other people or other beings, uh, and you try to kind of help them if, if possible. Uh. So this is the two sides of uh, morality, and, uh, and if you really want to develop on the path, you have to get those two sides right. Avoid the bad, but also do the good. Uh, yeah, then you really kind of get these things together. Uh. So that is what this is about, uh, and this is what we are trying to, trying to do here. Uh. So, um, how do we do this? And so maybe you think that, oh, it's going to be hard to give rise to feelings of compassion and all these kind of things. Sometimes the heart just doesn't want to go there, yeah, and that's, that's life. Sometimes it doesn't go there. So what do you do? You just start, uh, and you see what happens. Uh, you don't try to be perfect straight away. You realize that uh, the mind needs to be developed over time to be able to realize these kind of states of mind. But if you keep on doing it, uh, you're going to get there. If you keep on investigating, scrutinizing, like you were talking about yesterday, you scrutinize what is going on, you compare it to the suttas, uh, gradually you kind of, you you uncover this uh, and you start to have more compassion and understanding for, for people around you. Uh. So don't put the bar, set the bar too high. A lot of kamma that we make is not really black or white. 
often people talk about kamma as either black or white, but actually it is not really like that, uh, because very often our minds have mixed motives. Uh, yeah, you, you want to be kind, but maybe there's a little bit of greed there as well. It's kind of things are often mixed up. Uh, so don't try to be perfect straight away. Just work on it uh, and see what happens. And then you learn how to purify and make that kamma brighter and brighter and brighter uh, until eventually you have really bright kamma. If you come out of a peaceful meditation state, uh, then often the mind will be very much more pure, and then you can see that you, are, you have more ability to live up to these kind of standards. Uh, and sometimes you just feel these strong feelings of kind of kindness and compassion and generosity for everyone around you. Uh, and when you feel that, you know you're on the right track. Yeah. So this is the, uh, uh, this is the first uh, precept here, uh, or the first kind of type of bodily action. Uh, and uh, the, uh, because of that compassion is the root of what makes this true, uh, it is compassion, it is our motivation that makes a kamma, dark or bright. Yeah? And this is so important to understand, because once you understand that it is your uh, <coughs> motivation uh, that uh, does this, uh, then uh, you become more flexible in how you look at your actions. Uh, yeah, so there's lots all of these ethical dilemmas in the world, like, you know, is it, if someone wants to die, is it okay to allow them to die? We, in Australia we call it voluntary assisted suicide, VAD. And is that okay? And um, we were supportive, actually, uh, the Buddhist community in Perth was supportive of that, uh, of that. Because why? Well, because if someone wants to die, and you are sure that they have kind of gone through the right procedures, that they just had enough of life, they can't do it anymore, and if they have gone through the right procedures, they are in the right mind, uh, as long as the motivation is right, uh, it's not really bad karma. Yeah, so this is, this is how these things are. Remember, it's motivation that matters, not the act. The act can be very complicated. And there was an Englishman, one of my, who I remember from the time I lived in England many, many years ago, and uh, he wrote to me in an email and he said that he had this very bad neurological illness. And that neurological illness, basically the body just gets worse and worse and worse until eventually uh, you just lie there, you can't do anything. Yeah, and kind of everything is kind of plugged into your body and, and you're completely... Uh, you know, useless, basically. Yeah. So he asked me this question about, uh, you know, committing suicide, whether that, whether that, how that is from a kamma perspective. Uh, and I told him from a kamma perspective, I didn't recommend to him you should do it, uh, because that's kind of, that's, that would be really inappropriate. Uh, but I spoke about the kamma, and how you have to think about kamma in terms of motivation, what drives you in these things. Uh. And so then he decided to do it. Uh, he decided I'm going to go ahead with uh, giving up the, um, uh, uh, giving up my life, so he went to a clinic in Switzerland uh, uh, where they have this called Dignitas. Dignitas means like dignity, yeah, you die with dignity, and then they, there they kind of put everything in order for you so you can kind of end your life when you, will, when you want to. And he did that. And it's kind of interesting because uh, it's interesting because when you talk about these things in theory, it's one thing, but when someone actually commits suicide on your kind of um, suggestion, uh, yeah, that's kind of very. <laughs> Very different. It's like, oh, my, my, have I really said the right thing here? You kind of become much more careful. Huh? So you have to remember that whenever you do things, it often has these effects in the world. People actually do listen to you, especially if you are a monk. Yeah, people listen to you because you've been doing this for a long time. Especially being a monk for a long time, like yeah, I don't know, I've only I haven't been that long yet. How long have I been a monk? Twenty-five years. So still kind of. Uh, working on it, uh, but Ajahn Brahm has now been a monk for 45 years, 46 years, something like that. Uh, so so uh, then people trust that, and I felt quite at ease with it. Uh, it wasn't a problem. Uh, I felt I gave him some good advice uh, on, on what to do, uh, and uh, he ended his life before it became unbearable and really useless. You can't use your life to anything, uh, and that's what he, what he did. Uh, and his wife was supportive and everything, so there was no problem. Uh. And this is one of the amazing things about Buddhist morality, which is so uh, nice about Buddhist morality. It's a very flexible moral system, uh, because it's not rule-based. Most moral systems in the world are rule-based. Uh, yeah, God says, don't do this, don't do that. Okay, God, I, I will follow you what you say. Uh, that's what kind of the standard way, the Ten Commandments, and this kind of stuff. Uh, but Buddhism is not like that. There are five precepts, uh, but the five precepts are not the final say on morality. The final say is always uh, what is your intention, what is your motivation in driving, uh, driving your action. Uh, and you see that in the suttas, in places like the Anguttara Nikaya 3s, 
when he talks about all the uh, various roots of actions, yeah, so the roots of unwholesome actions are always uh, loba dosa moha, desire, ill will, and confusion. Uh, and the roots of wholesome action is the exact opposite, aloba, adosa, amoa, lack of ill will, lack of desire, lack of delusion. Uh, so uh, there it is, right there in the suttas. Uh, so five precepts is kind of handy as a shorthand, yeah, you don't have to think too much, you just know what you're doing. Uh, but if you want to go deeper, uh, you have to see it from this deeper perspective. Okay, so remember the, mo the most important point here is simply that there is two sides to all morality. There is the avoiding of the bad and the doing of the good. So then we have the next one, abandoning the taking of what is not given. He abstains from taking what is not given. In other words, he abstains from stealing. Yeah. Taking only what is given, expecting only what is given. By not stealing, he abides in purity here. So uh, you, uh, you don't steal, expecting only what is given. It means desiring only what is given is really what it means. Uh, you, only desire, you don't desire to take anything. Yeah, so your mind is pure, fairly pure as well. Uh, and then you uh, stop, you don't steal. Uh, so uh, so that pretty obvious, yeah, but the, the, the things I mentioned for the previous one are also valid for this one. Uh, stealing comes in all kinds of kinds and degrees and some kind of theft is really, really bad. If you're just greedy and angry or whatever and you steal something, is bad. But if there is like a very critical and difficult situation, then stealing might not be so bad. If someone is dying and you think, okay, I'll just take it and I'll pay it back later or something like that, uh, then of course it's not so bad. So again, the whole intention and motivation around it matters enormously for how bad it is. Uh, the opposite of not stealing is to be generous, uh, yeah, to give. Uh, if you steal, you are greedy. If you're generous, you are kind of anti-greedy, the alobaha and you're sharing with the world. Why isn't that mentioned here? And the reason why it is not mentioned uh, is because generosity, giving, is such an important part in its own right. Uh, it's such a massive thing, actually. The Buddha always uh, takes it out of the ordinary uh, uh, lists of, uh, of morality uh, and gives it a kind of separate place on the Buddhist path. Uh, and that is the uh, uh, generosity here. Uh. So that is the second factor of right action. Uh, Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart, uh, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Uh, and this is not a good translation, uh, because it's not really in celibacy, you abandon sexual activity. That, that is the right translation here. Uh. So you, you don't have any sexual activity, you live apart, uh, abstaining from the common practice of sexual intercourse. Not vulgar sounds really derogatory, it's, it's common is what it means. Uh, ordinary, yeah, what everyone does basically. So uh, that is uh, that particular one and it's interesting. You, you may wonder, is this really to do with morality? <laughs> Now, if you remember, we were just looking at the Aganya Sutta the other day, uh, and according to the Aganya Sutta, yeah, the first kind of immor immorality that uh, arose in the world uh, was precisely the breaking of this particular precept. That was the first one. Uh, yeah, were you here? Some of you were here for the Aganya Sutta, and that that was the first one. So, is it immoral? Uh, how can this be immoral? Yeah, just having en just enjoying yourself in the world. Is, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, and uh, the point is, it's not really all that immoral. It is not something which kind of creates a lot of suffering necessarily, uh, if you use it wisely and you are kind of smart about it. Uh, that's not really the point. The point is rather morality in Buddhism is so broad, incredibly broad. So it is about your mental states. Uh, yeah? So if you, uh, the idea of having greed, any kind of desire in the mind is actually a kind of immorality from the Buddhist point of view. Uh, it's a small immorality, it's not a big deal. It's not something you have to feel really bad about or anything like that. Buddhism is not a kind of religion where you feel bad about these things. But uh, the point is that uh, uh, it, your mind is not going to be all that pure if you keep on with these, these things. Uh, and that is really the point here. Uh, and uh, you see this in a number of places in the suttas where Buddha compare people uh, and those people who are celibate or who abstain fully from any sexuality, they are the ones who are always uh, kind of put the highest uh, yeah, in, the, in Buddhism. They have a higher degree of purity in their mind. Uh, 
And why is this so important? You may wonder, I, I, I mentioned this before, but maybe I can mention it again uh, to understand why this really matters. Uh, and uh, it's very common in the West, yeah, I, I, especially, I don't know if I should say America, but uh, <coughs> usually Americans are usually the leaders in all of these kind of things. So they, um, in America, they're very common to say, I want both. Yeah, I'm not going to give up all the pleasures of life. I'm going to meditate and have the pleasures of life. That's the kind of the, how they want things to be here. And you can think, mm, you have a point. Yeah, f fair enough. Yeah, well, why should we give up one happiness and then kind of maybe have another happiness which isn't all that happy? You're struggling with meditation, not really working anywhere. Yeah, m maybe that is the right way to go. Huh? And for most people, that is how they live their life. Yeah, they don't give up sexual. Um, activity. Uh, and when you go on retreat, that is when you give it up for a while and then you have a special chance to go a bit deeper in your meditation. Uh, but the whole idea is that um, all that sensu sensuality, uh, not just sexuality, but any sensuality uh, where you are attached to the external world around you, uh, that attachment to the world outside will stop you from going inwards uh, into samadhi. Going inwards is precisely the letting go of the external world. Uh, if you want to take samadhi all the way to the depth, you have to let go of that external world, yeah, at least temporarily. Yeah. So that is the reason. Yeah. So uh, here we are talking about the monk, yeah, there's the one who has gone forth, so that's why it is the, the criteria are so high. Uh, but uh, that, that for lay people is different, but at least that is, uh, that, 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 that is what it is about and how these things kind of work. And uh, so uh, that is why we, we live, we have the, the monastic life is the way it is, uh, to allow yourself to really attain those deeper states of meditation. Of course, you have to do it properly. You can't just give it up externally, you have to give it up internally as well. You can't really think about these things, because uh, if you think about them, it's going to be a similar kind of problem. Uh, so you really have to give it up properly. That's why it's there. So just so you are aware, because uh, it may not be obvious why that should be the case. Okay. Now we come to right speech. So we just had Samma Kamanta, and you will notice that in this gradual training, Samma Kamanta comes before Samma Varsha. Now comes Samma Varsha, but in the Noble Eiffel Path, Samma Varsha comes before Samma Kamanta. Yeah? Why is that? Is that important? <laughs> Does it matter which one comes first? And uh, I don't think so. I don't think it matters. These are all moral uh, about morality. Uh, yeah. And uh, in the Noble Eightfold Path, for some reason, I'm not sure why, Vacha, Samavacha comes first, uh, and then Samakamanta, and here is the other way around. Uh, and maybe the reason why it is different ways is precisely to make the point that it doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe that is precisely the point. Uh, the Buddha is saying it doesn't matter which one you do first. Uh, and by juggling the sequence, that, that might actually be what he is saying. Uh, yeah? Maybe. I don't know. Sometimes you just have to make educated guess. Uh, and uh, so that is an educated guess. If you have any ideas about that, uh, please let us know later on. So, abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. So you don't lie, but it's not just that you don't lie, yeah? It's actually you are trustworthy. Your speech is accurate. It is, uh, it's not, you're not trying to get away with things. Yeah, maybe I can get away with it if I don't lie, but I kind of stay on the borderline between lying and truth. But no, it's actually by moving as much as you possibly can towards truth, uh, yeah? not to deceive anyone. Uh, if you kind of try to be on the borderline between truth and falsehood, then you are kind of deceiving people. You're pretending that something is one way when actually you're not really committing yourself fully. Uh. So this is an important point. Yeah? I try to be, we try to be as truthful as possible. Uh. And it's hard to always be truthful. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult because often the ego gets in the way. The ego doesn't want to admit something. It's embarrassing. It is kind of all of these things. Uh, yeah, if um, you know, if you have done something which isn't quite right, and someone asks you, you don't really want to tell them. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's not really nice to go around telling people the bad things you have done. So this is actually quite hard. Uh, 
So uh, what you can do if you get in that sort of situation and you feel really embarrassed or whatever, what you can do, or you can say, I don't want to talk about it now, let's come back to this later. You can use these kind of techniques so you don't really, because you don't want to suffer too much either over being truthful. Uh, it's not about having maximum suffering. Uh, it's about, in the long run, finding that right balance. Yeah? So you are honest about things and doing things in the right way. Uh. And that was a question we had the other day, about sometimes you have to be truthful and you have to tell people as it is, uh, even if it hurts, I think was the question. Uh. And uh, again, ask yourself, where are you coming from? Uh? When you say that, are you coming from compassion? Uh? If you are coming from compassion, sometimes it is necessary to hurt other people. Yeah, like your children, sometimes uh, they have to learn not to cross the street when the cars are coming. Don't go over the street now, that big car is bigger than you. You're not gonna, it's not gonna be nice if you cross the car now. So you have, sometimes you have to be a bit direct, yeah, with your children or with other people. Uh, but you always ask yourself, what is my motivation? Uh, am I coming from as much compassion and kindness as possible? Uh, or what is it? Uh, and you will notice that if you are too angry with your children, yeah, when the children are naughty or whatever, uh, often they won't listen to you. Uh, yeah? And the reason they won't listen to you is because they know that you are not coming. You're not saying it for their benefit. You're saying it for almost like your benefit. Yeah? When you get anger, it's like you lose your authority or, or something like that. <coughs> and so you're actually not saying it for them, their benefit anymore. You're saying it more because of you're driven by that anger. It's for yourself uh, to get that anger out of your system. Uh. And children, they notice these things. Yeah? They know what is going on. Uh. So and I, I'm sure this is very hard. I have no idea how to you know, bring up children, uh, for, ob for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. or maybe I do, actually. maybe that's a lie. Because probably in past lives, yeah, probably had many children. Maybe I just need to kind of go think properly. Uh. Um, but uh, it's, I'm sure it is very, very hard. But this is kind of the whole point. It is hard, but that which is hard to do, if you can change and think differently, it gives very good results. Yeah, if you can change your attitude to your kids, uh, Remember, your kids are little robots. Yeah, they run here, they do that, not because they want to, they don't really want to be naughty, they just kind of, they don't know what they're doing, they're all over the place, that's what little kids are. Huh? And when they get teenagers, they're even worse. Teenagers, they're kind of really, really naughty. Huh? And so it's not, you know, they are not really kind of, they're just following this inner program. The inner program says, yeah, I'm a teenager, I must rebel, yeah, and I must be rebellious. And that's okay. So the idea is then to have that ability to understand that child, where they're coming from, uh, and then being able to speak to them in a way which is nice, despite how hard it might be to do that. Uh. And it's, it's very powerful. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have noticed when someone like Ajahn Brahm tells you off. Uh, what does it feel like? It doesn't really feel like he's telling you off. Uh. You feel like he's doing something out of compassion to help you. That's what it feels like. Uh, yeah? So if you can do that with others, if you can tell them, off or point them in the right direction in such a way that the you, they feel that you're being compassionate towards them, wow, you have won everything. Uh, because then they are very likely to listen. You are doing it for their benefit, uh, for their better life, uh, and then it is good. Uh, the problem is that with children is that the attachments, yeah? And when we are attached, uh, attachment distorts your ability to see things in the right way. So attachment makes you become self-interested. You have a vested interest in how that child behaves. Uh, if that child, beha if you go to a party somewhere and lots of other people around and your child behaves badly, uh, you kind of, it kind of you know, looks bad for the whole family, right? Uh, this is kind of the point. Uh, but the other children, if they misbehave, you couldn't care less. That doesn't matter at all. It's kind of completely irrelevant. Uh, so we tend to be a bit self-centered about these things uh, when really it is not really required. Uh, but this is where the practice is, yeah? In these kind of things, if you live the lay life, yeah, actually monastic life as well, because, you know, the monks are almost like your family in a sense. Uh, it's a sim simpler kind of thing here. Yeah. And then you are on the right track here. Yeah. So be honest if you can. Be as honest as you can. Remember to, you know, but don't be honest in a stupid way here. Yeah. Be honest in a wise way here. Yeah. Don't hurt others. Uh, don't be honest at inappropriate times when honesty is just a way of getting back at somebody or whatever. That is also wrong here. Yeah. You have to see the whole picture. Understand your motivation, why you are saying things. Uh, then you're on the right track here. Yeah. Okay. Next one. He abandoning, abandoning malicious speech. Uh, he abstains from malicious speech. Uh, he does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. 
Thus he is one who reunites those who are divided, divided uh, a promoter of friendship, uh, uh, who enjoys concord or harmony, who rejoices in harmony and delights in harmony, a speaker of words that promote harmony. Uh. So, uh, again, it's very beautiful, isn't it? It's very nice and it's very hard to kind of um, get to this kind of level. Uh. But uh, you will notice here what is interesting is that malicious speech comes after false speech. And what that means is that malicious speech is the sec is a, uh, uh, everything in the sutta, as I said before, has a certain sequence. So malicious speech is the second most bad kind of speech. Yeah, it is, it is the second bad. So lying is the worst, malicious speech is the bad. And then harsh speech, actually less bad than malicious speech. So what you're doing here is you're breaking up uh, friendships, pulling people apart. Uh, you're saying, oh, these, uh, you know, these Christians and Muslims, they are no good, uh, or whatever. But actually, sometimes the Christians and Muslims may be better than some of the Buddhists who are around. Uh, they may have really good hearts. Uh, they may actually live uh, for the benefit of the world in many ways. Uh, maybe they have a wrong view, but, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe they even have a right view. Uh, sometimes it's hard for a Muslim to come out because the pressure of society is so great, yeah? But uh, I know when I go to Indonesia, for example, uh, you get all of these Muslims. They come up to you and want to talk to you afterwards, and they ask you questions about meditation practice. Uh, I think it's amazing. Uh, isn't that great? And uh, you get the feeling that they actually they would rather be Buddhist, but they can't really do that. Uh, that's a feeling you get. Uh, so it's, uh, it's great. So we should need to be very careful. One of the reasons why we speak malicious speech is because we get upset with somebody. Uh, and when you are upset with somebody, you don't really want to talk good things about them. Uh, yeah, you actually you want to say bad things often if, if you are upset with somebody, but don't fall for that trap. If you are upset with somebody, uh, try to overcome that upset. Uh, this is really what it is all about. Uh, see the other aspects of that person. Uh, see their robot nature inside, uh, that they are just doing these things, whatever reason it is. Uh, and then you don't, you don't have any enemies in the world. You don't have anyone who allows you to, uh, who upsets you at all. Uh, and what a wonderful life that is, when we don't have any enemies or anything like that. Other people may have enemies, it's their problem. Uh, but I am not going to have any enemies in my life. Uh. And this is one of the nice things about being a Buddhist monk. You don't have many enemies, uh, you know, or you don't actually have other people who are your enemies. Uh. I remember Ajahn Brahm has a very interesting story. He told me soon after the bhikkhuni ordination in that we had in Perth. Uh, yeah, it was very controversial. <laughs> And uh, so he was summoned to Thailand and he was kind of kicked out of the Wat Pa Pong and all of that. Uh, and uh, okay, so fine. But what was so marvelous about it, Ajahn Brown told me, okay, soon afterwards uh, he had a dream. And in this dream, he gave a hug to one of these monks on the other side. Yeah, one of the kind of prime movers on the other side, he kind of gave him a hug. In other words, there's no ill will there. There's no animosity here. Yeah, there's that purity of heart, even though. You might argue that they did something unfair, yeah, you could argue that, but uh, that is not what Ajahn Brahm was focusing on. Uh, instead, uh, these are your friends. Uh. So he was dreaming, he gave him a hug. That's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, must be coming from the heart. If it's a dream, yeah, in, in real life you might give a hug, or oh, kind of you know, grudgingly, don't really want to give them a hug, but, but in a dream, you can't really lie in a dream. Your, kind of, your mind sort of does its own thing. Yeah. So it's a beautiful way of thinking about things. Uh, and uh, looking at the things in life that unites people, uh, br brings us together. We love to look at what divides us. And uh, the reason why we love to look at what divides us uh, is because of our identity. As a talk I was giving the other day, yeah? identity wants to divide because it gives you a solid sense of who you are. You, you make yourself who you are in comparison to others. Uh, and that's why you have to be careful. Uh. So take away that kind of identity. Uh. And that, that is where the power of have taking a, your precepts or your kindness as your identity instead becomes so beautiful. Uh, and you don't make these distinctions in society. Uh, We're not as different as we think. Uh, yeah? This life, uh, you are born in Malaysia, I was born in Norway. Uh, next life, uh, you might be born in Norway, I'll be born in Malaysia. Uh, it's true, isn't it? Uh, this is how it goes around. Uh, it's not, these things are so incredibly unsolid. Uh, one life you're a man, next life you're a woman. One life you're wealthy, next life you're poor. Uh, one life you're stupid. Uh, Another life you are intelligent, uh, one life, so, so it's just so uncertain and when you think in this way you can embrace everybody here uh, because they're all really like you, uh, there's nothing different, it's all inside of you waiting to come out. Uh, these divisions that we make in society are so painful, leads to war, leads to animosity here. Uh, 
I remember reading, this was uh, when the war in Afghanistan was going on, uh, yeah, and the British were involved, I think, um, and uh, the, uh, there was someone who was... Uh, someone who, who was interviewed, yeah, some Afghani, and this Afghani said, yeah, no, these British, they are terrible people. Uh, I remember Alexander the Great, yeah, he came here 2,300 years ago, yeah, and we haven't forgotten, absolutely not. Uh, and that was kind of the, uh, the, 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 the <laughs> it's, it's crazy, yeah, you pass that animosity down from one generation to the next one. Don't forget about Alexander the Great, yeah, these people from the West, these Europeans, don't trust them. Uh, 2,300 years ago, it's nothing. It's only a hundred generations. Yeah, <laughs> and it's kind of, when I read that, I thought it was, it was hilarious almost. But actually, it's not really hilarious at all. It's actually quite uh, scary. It shows you something about our identity and how solid it is, uh, and how we can't give up. Uh, these are probably very proud people. Yeah, when when they come with these kind of things. Uh. Okay, let us go on to the next one. Huh? Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words uh, as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, lovable as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by the many, and agreeable to many. Yeah, yeah you try to speak in a gentle way. And uh, again, this takes quite a lot of mindfulness to be able to do that. Often in daily life, you just want to get things done, do this, do that, and you forget about this gentleness of speech. But it's so nice to hear gentle speech, because you can relax in the presence of gentle speech. Uh, if speech is harsh, you can't really relax around people. Uh. So one of the things that I always found so powerful about right speech, uh, you always have the opportunity to give a gift uh, to other people when you speak. Yeah, this is such a beautiful idea, because we actually, the degree to which we influence other people by how we speak is so enormous. Uh. If you, someone speaks to you, you can feel really hurt by someone's spe speech. It can be very painful. Yeah. And so we have a very powerful tool in our hands. Yeah, the speech is a very powerful tool on both the negative and the positive. So remember that. If you say something to people that is kind and gentle and hi harmonious and all of these things and meaningful, we come to that later on, it's like you're giving people a gift and they feel good in your presence. Yeah. And they feel kind of happy to be around you because you are that kind of person. And if other people shout around and have a big argument, you can just sit there quietly. You don't have to take part in these things. Uh, and then you uh, can be out of this and you can actually speak in the right way. So remember that, actually, every time you open your mouth, you have the potential for influencing other people's feelings so powerfully here. So because of that, do what is kind. Uh, always remember that uh, and then uh, give them a gift every time you open your mouth. Uh, yeah, may you be well and happy here. Uh, and uh, whatever it is. Uh, so uh, it's, it, all, all I, I always loved these particular little paragraphs here because they are so beautifully put by the Buddha. You reunite those who are divided, you promote friendships, you enjoy harmony and rejoice in concord, uh, delight in harmony, a speaker of words that promote harmony. Uh, you, ab you abstain from harsh speech and you speak speech that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, uh, lovable as go to the heart, uh, hadayagama, are courteous, uh, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Uh, there you are, it's desired by many when you hear those words. And you know what it's like, some people have this ability to speak in a way that you feel good uh, in their presence. Uh, and then you know that what, a little bit about what right speech is all about. Uh. The last one, abandoning gossip, uh, yeah, or idle chatter is probably better, because gossip is a bit like malicious speech perhaps, but idle chatter might be better, pointless chatter. Huh? He abstains from pointless chatter. Huh? He speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, uh, speaks on what is good, uh, speaks on the Dhamma and the practice. Uh, at the right time he speaks such words that are worth recording. Uh, reasonable, uh, moderate, they have a limited length, you don't talk at too much length, uh, and they are beneficial. Uh, yeah, again, very, uh, very um, inspiring uh, to speak in this way. Uh, speak what is fact, speak what is good. Uh, the Dhamma, the discipline here, the Pali word is Vinaya, I think the better translation is training. Uh, you, you, ha you have the teaching and you have the training here. Uh. 
And that at the right time, this is an important point, you speak at the right time. You know when is the wrong time to speak. You don't speak when it is nobody's listening or, or uh, you don't speak when you have no impact or you don't speak when people are busy or you know, you, you know the right time to speak. Yeah. And you speak words that are worth recording. Yeah, it's like, wow, I heard this word, I better remember that because I can use that in my practice. Uh, it's like you read the word of the Buddha and then you record it in your mind, some of this advice from the Buddha. Uh, record, worth recording. Uh, gee, what a wonderful thing it is to have some words worth recording. The vast majority of words in this world are not really worth recording. It's just uh, uh, nothing. They are reasonable. They are built up with a kind of a... With, with a with um, reason or with logic or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they're not kind of just uh, sp spoken out on the spur of the moment, but you have thought about it properly. Yeah. Moderate, pariyantavati, they have an end. They don't kind of go on forever. Yeah. And they are beneficial. You make sure that they are beneficial to the person you are speaking to. Yeah. So that is the abstaining from idle chatter. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't know, I, I always like to read this out simply because it's easy to forget uh, all the details and because I think it's very beautifully put. Uh, yeah, the Buddha really gets to the bottom of things here, puts it in a really nice way. Uh, and uh, for that, I, I, every time I read it, I think, wow, this is what, how we should really be talking to each other. Uh, hard to live up to all the time, but that's kind of the point. Hard to live up to means that you have something to kind of work towards. Uh, when you make a mistake, never put yourself down because you made a mistake. Yeah. Rather understand why you made that mistake. Yeah. Never feel guilty or anything like that because that just blocks your ability to understand why you made the mistake. If you feel guilty about it or you feel bad about it, or you want to punish yourself or whatever, that is no good. Uh. Rather just have a cool mind and try to understand why did I make that mistake? Mm, for such and such a reason. And then you can shape it in the future in a different direction. Uh. Okay. So that is right speech. So we have now looked at the first four factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, going quite fast, which is uh, okay. <coughs> so um, we come back again in 15 minutes and we'll do some Q&A. So if you have any questions about this, please, uh, please write them down.